Okay, this video is going to cover a topic, a couple topics that I already went over, but the video stopped recording. So we're going to finish up this module and I'm just going to kind of go over it real quickly. So this topic here is inverse functions, quadratics, or square roots. Okay, those two guys are inverses of each other. So we're going to find the inverse of such functions. So here it has f of x equals the square root of 3 minus x plus 5. It has the domain over here on the right hand side. So they're asking us for two bits of information here. They're asking us to find the inverse of f and then they're also asking us to find the domain of the inverse of f. Okay. Now to find the inverse of f we're going to use the strategies that were outlined in your algebra. present. So what we do is we change the fan notation f of x into just a y. And so then now that we have y equal to the right hand side of the function notation, we can interchange the x's and y's. So all y's become x's and all x's become y's. And then now we have this line here. Then we start to solve for y. So the first thing we need to do is isolate the radical, so we subtract 5 on both sides. We end up with x minus 5 on the left and the square root of 3 minus y on the right. To get rid of the square root, we square both sides of this function, so we end up with x minus 5 squared and the radical and the square have canceled each other out, so we just have the radicand 3 minus y. Then to continue solving for y, we're going to subtract 3 on both sides. So we end up with x minus 5 squared minus 3 equal to negative y. And then to get y completely by itself, we divide by negative 1 to every term. So we end up with negative x minus 5 squared plus 3 equal to positive y. And then the last step of solving or finding the inverse is instead of writing y, you write f inverse of x. But the left hand side is still represented here on the right. Now, to find the domain of f inverse, okay, we need to know some properties here. One is that the domain of f is equivalent to the range of f inverse. And the domain of f inverse is equivalent to the range of f. This is very important because you need to use f, which is given, and its domain, which also happens to be given, to find the domain and the ranges of the inverse. Because the domain and range of the inverse depends on the domain and the range of f. Because all you're doing is swapping the domain and the range. When you create this swap motion here of the x and the y, interchanging those variables, you now interchange interchanged the domain and the ranges. So the domain the range of the inverse and the range is now the domain of the inverse okay so we need to calculate what's the range of f that way we can determine what the domain of the inverse is you cannot find the domain of the inverse just by simply looking at the expression that you found because this expression is only valid for um the original x values that were given here so these x values give you what kind of values you'll get here and then you interchange them so that causes some issues okay so what we need to do is we need to find the range of f and to do that we start plugging in these values so we have to start at three so I started with three and then I started picking numbers that were less than three toward negative infinity and I chose to pick two and negative one I solely chose to pick these only because I wanted to get perfect squares inside my square root I could have chosen 3, 0, 5, whatever, I, or negative 5, whatever I wanted as long as it was in this interval. But you want to start with the end point where the bracket is and then pick values toward the negative infinity. Don't want to go out of order, meaning I don't want to pick 3 and then negative 1 and then positive 2. Okay, it has to be in order. And the reason why is because you want to see if the function here 
is actually increasing in y value or if it's decreasing in y value. And if you're toggling around with x values, your y values are going to toggle around and it's not going to be evident on whether or not the function was increasing or decreasing. So what we've done here first is we plugged in the end point 3. When we plug it inside the square root, we get the square root of 0 plus 5 which is 0 plus 5, which is just 5. Then when we plug in the next x value that we picked, we pick 2. 3 minus 2 is 1. So this is the square root of 1 plus 5, which is 1 plus 5, which ends up being 6. Then I picked a negative 1. So 3 minus a negative 1 is actually 3 plus 1, which gives me 4 inside the square root, and then of course add 5. Square root of 4 is 2, plus 5 is 7. And so if you notice, these x values are increasing, which means that my range is going to be from 5 and then keep increasing to positive infinity. And so that if my range of f is this, then that also tells me the domain of f inverse is equivalent to 5 to infinity, with 5 included. Okay, <clears throat> the squareds are a little bit more complicated to figure out, okay? <clears throat> if I were to follow the rules, first change the fancy notation f of x to y, interchange the variables, so the y becomes an x, the x becomes a y, and then start solving for x. So to get rid of this square, I would square root both sides, which means I get plus or minus the square root of x, and over here the square and the square root would undo each other, so I just have the radicand y plus 8. Then I would need to minus 8 and minus 8 on both sides. And then I wouldn't have this expression, plus or minus square root of x minus 8, which means I actually have two functions here. I have y equal to the square root of x minus 8, the positive version, and then y equals negative square root of x minus 8. How do I know which one is the answer? It all depends on this domain, okay? So if I take this domain, and I draw it here, remember what a squared function looks like. This is a squared function, and then I have a translation of 8 here. So the graph is going to move the original parabola from the origin, and it's going to move it to the left 8 units. So at negative 8, that's where my parabola is going to start to open up. But the domain of this parabola is only from negative 8 to infinity. So from this negative 8 x value, toward infinity, which means only the right-hand side of the graph, not the left-hand side, which is why the left-hand side here is dotted. I could just erase it all together if I chose to. Now, um, this is the only part of the graph that we are talking about here, and it is this part of the graph that they want the inverse for. So remember what the inverse is. It's the x and y values interchanged, and it should reflect over the line y equals x. So if I take this point here, which has the coordinates of negative 8 comma 0, and I interchange those, I'm going to get the coordinates 0, negative 8, which is this spot here. And you could take another number, like for instance, um, oh, I don't know. Let's say 7, negative 7. Then that means I would be plugging in negative 7, which give me 1 squared, which is 1. So the value here is negative 7 and comma 1. If I interchange that, I get 1 and negative 7, which is that point there. Okay. So we get these graphs here that look like this. And they do reflect over the line y equals x. But, what is the range of f? Because we're going to need that, right? When not only, they were given, they gave us the domain of f that was given to us. This is the domain of f. What we need to know is the range so we can determine the domain of f inverse. Well, the range of this is the y values. And since there's this point here, the y value here is 0 and it shoots up to positive infinity. So the range of f is from 0 to infinity. Now, notice, which part of the function did we take? We took this side of the, the parabola. And then when we transferred it over, we got this. 
So if you take the square root of x function and you shift it down 8, this is the graph that you end up with. So this is why this is circled. This is most likely my answer. Whereas if I look at the other one, here's what an original square root of function looks like. And not only have I shifted it downward 8 units, but I've also reflected over. So if I reflect it over, it looks like that. And then if I shift it down 8 units, it'll look like this. This is not what this looks like. Okay, so this one is not the correct inverse. So there is my inverse. I just wrote it in its inverse notation. So instead of y, I wrote f inverse of y. And then there's my inverse square root of x minus 8. And of course, the domain of f inverse should match the range of f. And so that's 0 to infinity. Now let's work with the cubic and cube root functions. These are a bit easier in the fact that we don't have to consider the domain and range because the domain and range of a cubic and a cube root function is negative infinity to infinity. So every single one of these functions, both the originals and the inverses, will have a domain of negative infinity to infinity and will have a range from negative infinity to infinity. So they don't ask you to specify that in these problems. They're just asking you to find the inverse. So change the f of the x notation to y. Interchange the x and y's. So the y becomes an x, the x becomes a y. And then start to solve for y. So take the cube root of both sides. You have cube root of x equal to y plus 4, minus 4 on both sides. And then change the y notation to the f inverse notation. And you get the cube root of x minus 4. For this next example, sim similar thing. You're going to um, change the notation to y, interchange the x and the y's, subtract 4 on both sides, take the cube root on both sides, and you end up with the cube root of x minus 4 equal to y, or that g inverse of x equals the cube root of x minus 4. The reason I have these problems side by side is because you notice both of them end up with the square root of x and a minus 4. However, for f, your minus 4 is not inside the square root. And for g inverse, my minus 4 is inside the square root. It makes a huge difference. Look at what the functions look like to begin with. Okay? So depending on what your functions look like to begin with, it will matter whether or not these values are in or outside the roots. So be very, very careful that you're doing that properly. Now for this example, we do the same thing. So we're going to change the notation to y, interchange our x and y's, and then start to solve for y. So first isolate the radical by minusing 7 over to the left side, then taking the root cube power on both sides to get rid of the cube root. So we have y plus 1 equal to x minus 7 cubed, and then minus 1 to the left so that you end up with x minus 7 cubed minus 1 equal to y change the y notation into the f inverse notation, the left hand side of the equation becomes the right hand side of the equation. And that topic is done. Um, we have two more topics. One is the inverse of rational functions. So here you do the same thing and notice that they are asking you for the domain of h inverse. Well, in order for me to figure out what the domain of h inverse is, I need to know what the range of h is. So I did the techniques to graph this thing real quick. So we talk about the domain of h. The domain of this function is all real numbers except for when the bottom equals 0. So we know that 9 plus 8x cannot equal 0. So minus 9 over divide by 8, we get that x cannot equal negative 9 over 8. We also know that because this came from the denominator, there's a vertical asymptote at negative 9 over 8. And I actually graphed this wrong because that is not negative 9 over 8, is it? That is positive 9 over 8. So this may affect my range. So 1, 2, negative 9 over 8 is actually um, a whole number and then another eighth there. So that is the asymptote negative 9 over 8. Then, we know we have a horizontal asymptote because the degree of the numerator is 1, the degree of the denominator is 1, so the asymptote is automatically at the 
coefficient of the numerator over the coefficient of the denominator, so we get negative 1 over positive 8, which is a negative 1 8, which means this horizontal asymptote right here is just below the x-axis. Really close, but just below the x-axis. Um, we also know that we can get an x-intercept by setting the numerator equal to 0. So when I do that, I actually get, um, if I add x over, I get 2 equals x, which means there is an asymptote here. And if I were to want the y-intercept, we would plug in 0, and we get 2 over 9 when we plug in 0. So that's this y-value here. Now I know I cannot cross the vertical asymptote, and I know that the end is going to trail off really close to that horizontal asymptote. So the graph is going to look like this somewhat. Much smoother, but for the most part have this kind of curve. Okay? But it doesn't trail off to the x-axis. It trails off to this line just underneath the x-axis. But what is happening over here on the right-hand side? Right? That's what we need to know. On the right-hand side, have to plug in a number like say negative 2 to figure out what's going on there. So if I plug in negative 2, I'm going to get 2 plus 2 which is 4 and then 9 minus 16 which is negative 7. So I get a negative 4 sevenths which means the point is about right there and it is above the horizontal asymptote. Oh, no, it's not. My y value is negative 4.7. So here's negative 2, and negative 4.7 is actually down here. So then I have to trail toward my horizontal asymptote, and I cannot cross my vertical asymptote. So this is the graph here which means my range is not correct on this problem. So, what is the range? The range is the lowest y value, and it does go downward toward negative infinity. And then it goes up to this value, but it never touches it. So negative 1 eighth. But because I never touch it, I have to use a parentheses. Then above the asymptote, again, never touching negative 1 eighth, the y values shoot up to positive infinity. And so we get that. The domain of the inverse is this exact interval. So the domain of the inverse is going to be negative 8, negative 1 eighth, union negative 1 eighth to positive infinity. Now, let's find the inverse. So change the h of x notation to y. Interchange the x's and y's. So the y becomes an x and all the x's become y's. Then solve for y. So the first thing we did to make things easier on ourselves is get rid of the fractions by multiplying both sides by this denominator, which will cancel the denominator here. And on this side, if I distribute my x, I get 9x plus 8xy. Then if I get all my y terms on one side, because that's the variable I'm trying to isolate, get all the non-y terms to the right side, this is what we do. We add the y over here and over here, and we take this 9x and we minus it onto the other side. So this 9x is gone, this negative y is gone, and on the left-hand side I have 8xy plus y. On the right-hand side I have 2 minus 9x. Then to isolate the y, we first have to factor this y out from this expression. So we get y times 8x plus 1. And then to get the y completely isolated, we divide both sides by 8x plus 1. So we end up with y equal to 2 minus 9x over 8x plus 1. And then if we change the notation to h inverse of x, we still have this expression over here. Now, it is pure coincidence that if I were to take the domain of the inverse, it actually matches the domain that we got here. Sometimes it matches, sometimes it does not exactly. So make sure that you're finding the range of h before you try to determine what the domain of h inverse is.
don't do the math, and then try to find the domain from here. It is pure coincidence that if I set that not equal to zero, I get x cannot equal negative one eighth, which corresponds to this interval there. Now the very last topic in this section has to do with graphing the inverse. So this is what was given to me. Not even the dotted red line. All they gave me was this and asked me to graph the inverse. So what you need to do is remember that what an inverse does is it interchanges the x and the y's. So what I've done here is I've written the coordinates for each of these three points that I see. And then I've interchanged those points. So six, six, if I interchange them, it's still six, six. And so that spot is still there. If I take this point, five, zero, and I interchange it, I end up with the coordinates zero, five, which is this spot here. And then if I take the coordinates two, negative three, and interchange them, I end up with the coordinates negative three, positive two, which is this point here. And then just like these are connected, I connected my dots over here. And you'll notice that if I graph the line y equals x, this red dotted line, this is a mirror image of itself or of each other over that line. So it does fit the description of an inverse.